Jack McCall had gotten away with murder, but he couldn't keep his mouth shut. After assassinating Wild Bill Hickok, he was quickly captured, and on the next day, a mock trial was held in Deadwood, where he was found not guilty, despite overwhelming evidence. Jack McCall left Deadwood to go to Cheyenne, Wyoming, then to Laramie. He bragged to anyone that would listen that he was the one that killed Wild Bill. His bragging and big mouth eventually caught up with him, and on August 29th, less than a month after the murder, he was arrested by a deputy U.S. Marshal. The Deadwood trial wasn't legal, but this new one was. On January 3rd, 1877, Jack McCall was sentenced to death. On March 1st, 1877, the sentence was carried out. The following are two newspaper accounts of McCall's death, which was the first legal execution to take place in Dakota Territory. From the Lincoln County Advocate, March 7th, 1877, Canton, Dakota Territory. Execution of John McCall. The cold letter of the law was fulfilled at Yankton on Thursday last, in pursuance of the sentence passed by Chief Justice Shannon on the 3rd of January. McCall killed William Hickok, alias Wild Bill, in a saloon at Deadwood City on the 2nd of August. It was an assassination for McCall entered the room where Hickok was playing cards and without any word or warning, stepped behind Hickok and, aiming a revolver at his head, fired, killing him instantly. A jury of minors were impaneled and a mock trial had, in which McCall gave as a reason for his act that Hickok had killed his brother in Kansas, which statement has subsequently been ascertained to be false, and he was acquitted. Fearing apprehension by the legal authorities, he fled from the hills, but was arrested at Laramie City, where he had boasted of the murder. He was tried in Yankton and found guilty. Motion was made for a new trial, which was overruled. Appeal was taken to the Supreme Court, which court sustained the ruling of the court below, and remanded the case for execution of judgment. The president has been petitioned for a commutation of sentence to imprisonment for life, but the law was left to take its course, and on Thursday, the first record was made of a legal execution in Dakota Territory. To us, the details of a death scene upon the gallows are far from attractive, and doubtless the same with many of our readers. But this having occurred within our own territory, it comes with double force when considered as a warning to those who have become so reckless of life that a resort to the revolver is had upon every provocation, however slight, other than in self-defense. We extract from the report of Phil K. Falk, as given in the Yankton Press. The morning dawned cloudily, with a drizzling rain, the heavens seemingly draped in somber colorings for some Especially dreadful occasion. At half past eight o'clock, we were admitted to the United States Jail, where we found U.S. Marshal Burdick, Deputy Marshals C.P. Edmonds and Stanley, Reverend Father Daxiter, and J.A. Curry, his assistant. The Reverend Father was then engaged in religious ministrations with the condemned man, who seemed resigned to his fate. His fellow prisoners, McCarty and Allen, seemed more moved by the solemn ceremonies than McCall. At 9 o'clock a.m., Marshal Burdick, in the presence of the deputies named and the others present, read to the doomed man the death warrant. During the reading of this document, he manifested his usual apparent firmness, listening attentively, seemingly though, at the time, his soul must have been peering into the awful mysteries of the future. His irons had been removed, and at the conclusion of the reading, he stepped into his cell for a few moments. Upon his return, he conversed briefly, in a whisper, with his spiritual advisor. An air of gloom pervaded the interior of the jail, and Allen and McCarty hung their heads in silence. Outside of the jail yard, in the drizzling rain, was a crowd of curious lookers-on, anxious apparently to catch a fleeting glance of the unfortunate man who was soon to expiate his crime on the gibbet. McCall had prepared a written statement, which he designed should be published in our columns, after his death. 
But for some reason, unknown to us, he last evening destroyed the same. Evidently, he wished to hide, if possible, all traces of his past life. At half past nine, everything being in readiness, the condemned man bade farewell to his fellow prisoners and left his prison house for the last time. There were present at this time LDF Poor, representing the New York Herald, Bryant, reporter of a New England journal, Dr. Wixon and the Taylor Brothers of the Dakota Herald, and Phil K. Falk, representing the Press and Dakotian. Reverend Father Daxacher, J.A. Curry, his assistant, U.S. Marshal Burdick, and Deputy C.P. Edmonds, H.C. Ash, R.J. Stanley, and George D. Mathieson, Special Guard. Upon leaving the jail, Marshal Burdick, with Deputy Marshal Ash, occupied a carriage and led the way. They were followed by a carriage containing McCall, with Reverend Father Daxacher and his assistant, J.A. Curry, Deputy Marshal C.P. Edmonds, and ourself. This mournful train, bearing its living victim to the grave, was preceded and followed by a long line of vehicles of every description, with hundreds on horseback and on foot, all leading north, out through Broadway. The rain which was falling had moistened the earth and deadened the sound of the carriage wheels. Not a word was spoken during the ride of two miles to the school section north of the Catholic Cemetery. McCall still continued to bear up bravely, even after the gallows loomed in full view. At 10 o'clock precisely, the place of execution was reached. Sheriff Baker and Marshal Leeper had charge of police regulations at the ground, and had so efficiently discharged their duties in this respect that there was no crowding or other unseemly conduct at the scaffold. As soon as possible after reaching the ground, the prisoner mounted the platform of the gallows, accompanied by Deputy Marshal Ash. Here he evinced the same firmness and nerve that have already characterized him since his arrest and trial. He placed himself in the center of the platform facing east and gazed out over the throng without exhibiting the least faltering, not even a quiver of the lip. U.S. Marshal Burdick, with Deputy Ash, Reverend Father Daxacher and his assistant, Mr. Curry, were the only parties upon the platform. Immediately the limbs of the unfortunate culprit were pinioned when he knelt with his spiritual counsel. Turning his face toward heaven, his lips were seen to move in prayer. Upon rising, he kissed the crucifix, and after the black cap had been placed over his face, the U.S. Marshal placed the noose around his neck. He then said, Wait one moment, Marshal, until I pray. Marshal Burdick waited until he had uttered a prayer and then adjusted the noose when he said, Draw it tighter, Marshal. All was now in readiness, and the assemblage of nearly 1,000 persons seemed to hold their breath. It was an awful moment, the single step between life and death. At precisely 15 minutes after 10 o'clock, the trap was sprung, and with the single choking expression, O oh God, uttered while the drop fell, the body of John McCall was dangling between heaven and earth. The drop was four feet, and everything having been carefully arranged, there was but a brief struggle with the King of Terrors. The gallows was a frame eight by ten feet square. The platform in which the trap was arranged was eight feet from the ground. The entire structure, from two feet above the platform to the ground, was closely boarded up, so that it was impossible to observe the last death struggle of the unfortunate man. This arrangement reflects credit upon Marshal Burdick, and evinces the prudence and care with which every part of his painful duty was performed in connection with the last fleeting hours of John McCall. Twelve minutes after the drop fell, doctors D. F. Etter and J. M. Miller were admitted to the interior of the gallows and examined the body, pronouncing life extinct. McCall's head was inclined in a drooping position toward his breast. His hands were clenched and blue in one of which was still grasped the crucifix. After hanging ten minutes longer, the body was cut down and placed in a neat walnut coffin 
after which it was removed to the southwest corner of the Catholic Cemetery, where in full view of Yankton, two miles distant, it sleeps its long sleep. Upon the scaffold, McCall, neatly attired in black, cleanly shaven, and of slight build, looked indeed boyish, but met his death with the most unshrinking courage. Of all upon that fatal scaffold, he seemed least affected. Poor boy, the way of the transgressor is hard. From a letter received last evening by Marshal Burdick, it is ascertained John McCall is the true name of the young man executed today. Upon being shown the letter, McCall admitted it was from his sister in Louisville, Kentucky, where he also has a father and mother who had not heard of their wayward son for three years. The last chapter is ended, and John McCall and William Hickok are in eternity. Truly life is a dream filled with exciting shadows, and sometimes ending suddenly in deeper shadow, like the frightful awakening from a horrid nightmare. With regard to the execution, it must be said here that Marshal Burdick, with his assistants, Deputies Edmonds, Ash, Stanley, and Special Guard George D. Mathewson, performed their unpleasant duties most admirably. There was no indecent haste, no bungling, and no tedious waiting. They all deserve credit for efficiency and prudence in conducting to a close properly this last act in the life of Jack McCall. To Marshal Burdick, we are personally under obligations for gentlemanly courtesies shown and facilities given enabling us to give a truthful account of this first legal execution in Dakota Territory. As a fitting close to this tragic drama, we must say of Wild Bill, notwithstanding his eventful and exciting career as a scout of the Union Army during the war and on the frontier and the wild plains of the West, amongst wild and lawless whites and still more savage red men he was still a quiet and unassuming man peaceable and harmless except when menaced by the cold glitter of the bowie knife or the deadly muzzle of the revolver at such times his nerve and cool daring were unparalleled as soldier scout marshal sheriff and private citizen his qualities enabled him always by rapidity of execution and extraordinary fearlessness to defeat and destroy his enemies when the odds were overwhelming. No open enemy could have taken his life, except by sacrificing his own, and it remained for Jack McCall to assassinate him in an unsuspecting hour, when his back was toward the enemy. Though his life was bloody and adventurous, yet he was the champion of the weak and oppressed, and if he was not a paragon of excellence, he was at least a man of brave impulses. From the Eaton Democrat, March 15th, 1877, Eaton, Ohio. Hanging of Jack McCall. Yankton, Dakota Territory, Correspondence, Chicago Times. Jack McCall, the murderer of William Hickok, alias Wild Bill, suffered the penalty of the law at this place March 2nd, by being hanged by the neck until he was dead, dead, dead. The execution took place upon the open prairie, the gallows being erected upon a school section about two miles from the city near the Catholic cemetery. Every arrangement and detail of the tragic affair was conducted in the most successful manner, no failure or blunder being made in any particular. United States Marshal Burdick designed hanging McCall in as private a manner as possible. Notwithstanding his efforts to keep the location of the gallows and the hour a secret to the public, information of his plans leaked out and spread throughout the city with the rapidity of wildfire. At 9 o'clock a.m., when the marshal read the death warrant to the prisoner, a large crowd had gathered around the United States jail, which augmented in numbers when half an hour later, the doomed man was brought forth and placed in a closed carriage in the custody of Deputy Marshals Ash and Edmonds, attended by Reverend Father Dorcher, his religious advisor. Marshal Burdick entered his buggy and led off to the scene of the execution, followed by the carriage containing the prisoner and a large crowd of people eager to witness what was about to take place. Buggies, lumber wagons, barouches, omnibuses, 
and saddle horses had been called into requisition to convey the curious out to the prairie that they might see the hanging performance. The crowd was a motley one, comprising lawyers, doctors of medicine and of divinity, reporters, ragged boys, and demimond, Americans, Russians, and every other nationality, the grave and the gay, and in fact, exactly the materials of which Yankton is composed. Thus did this assemblage set out for the place of execution, many of who were unable to secure a ride going on foot, although yet scarcely ten o'clock the hour set for the drop to fall. On arriving within view, hundreds of people could be seen near the fatal spot, awaiting the arrival of the victim. The structure upon which McCall was to expiate his crime was about ten feet square, with the floor or platform about eight feet from the ground. From the floor down and about two feet above, it was tightly enclosed, so that when the drop fell, no one could see the writhings of death's agony. A few minutes before ten o'clock, the carriage containing the prisoner drove up, and the unfortunate McCall got out and walked up the steps, unaided, and apparently as cool and calm as any one among the hundreds who were eagerly watching his every move. He took his position on the platform without any direction, immediately under the beam to which the rope was attached. His arms were then pinioned and his feet tied together. During all this time he did not evince the least emotion, appearing as if nothing unusual was transpiring. He reached around with his hand and with much difficulty removed his hat and cast it down. Altogether it was a test of fortitude which few could stand and whatever crime or crimes he may have committed, however much he may have been dyed in iniquity, we must rather admire his bravery, which your reporter believes, under other and different circumstances, would make him a hero. Father Doricher and McCall then knelt down together and offered up a prayer, in which the latter fully participated in a reverential manner. After the prayer was finished, McCall then arose and said to the officers in charge, Tie the rope tight, boys. Don't let there be any mistake. United States Marshal Burdick then placed the black cap over his head, adjusted the rope around the neck, and then a few minutes of breathless silence were occupied by McCall in prayer, and then the trap was sprung. The victim dropped with a heavy thud, while the quick, agonizing cry of, Oh God, followed by a groan, and the body dangled motionless at the rope. At the expiration of twelve minutes, the physicians and attendants examined the body and pronounced life extinct. A crucifix which was held in McCall's right hand at the time of his execution was found clutched even with the grasp of death. After the body had remained suspended for twenty-five minutes, it was cut down, placed in a casket, and taken to a grave in the Catholic cemetery nearby and buried. This ended the excitement of the occasion. McCall is a native of Louisville, Kentucky, but has been a daring character on the Kansas and Colorado frontier for the past six years. He sought Wild Bill in a saloon in Deadwood, Black Hills, while the latter was engaged in a game of cards, and put a pistol shot through his head, killing him instantly. He was given an impromptu trial by a jury taken from among the miners, and acquitted on the representation that Wild Bill had killed a brother of his in Kansas. This, he has since admitted to, have been a fabrication. He was shortly afterward arrested and brought to Yankton for trial, upon which he was convicted with every opportunity to prove himself innocent. He has a sister living in Louisville, who, having noticed a stray item in a newspaper mentioning the fact of her brother's imprisonment here, wrote him a letter, which he received on the evening before the execution, and which he spent three hours of the night in answering. He was stolid to the last, and refused to give any of his past history to the many who were anxious to obtain a statement from him. Jack McCall was buried in the Sacred Heart Cemetery of Yankton. In 1881, when the cemetery was moved, it was discovered that he had been buried with the noose still around his neck. He does not have a headstone, but lies anonymously in one of two unmarked graves in the cemetery. <laughs> 